here towards that, that category. And then finally, the municipal equity. So the, the number at the very bottom, the $1.2 billion. Um, and the breakdown for that is on page seven of the financial statements. We actually break down what's, what's within that number. And that's kind of like our, our equity, our retained earnings amount at the end of the day. Uh, it breaks down into a couple of, of primary things. One, our investment in the capital assets, so that billion dollars of, of uh, over a billion dollars of investment in capital assets is, makes up part of that 1.2. All of our reserve funds, our capital reserve funds, of which there's about 200 million, that's within that number as well. And then any of our current year operating surpluses, and that's ours plus the uh, water, sewer, all the utility Kingston ones, the library, downtown business, any of the entities that are consolidated within these statements. So if you, if you drill down in and you go to page seven and you look at our current uh, municipal operating surplus number that's part of that 1.2 billion, that should match back to what we reported to council on April 19th when we brought the fourth quarter report when we talked about in that report what the surplus was made up of. So that's sort of how it ties back into these. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to mention was there is a recommendation uh, from staff with respect to updating our tangible capital asset policy. So we had a new policy that came in 2010 to council to approve, and that was the first time we had to actually record all of our, our capital assets on the financial statements. And so the policy came and there was an approval for um, not only the valuation of how we valued those, those assets for, for day one, but also how we're depreciating them each year and based on which rates. Uh, this is the first time we're actually looking at changing that policy. So each year we do look at the asset categories, how do we slice and dice them, what kinds of depreciation rates are we using based on useful lives. And so we've got a couple of things that we would like to update the policy with at this point in time. Um, primarily we've got some new asset classes that we would like to include and that just provides us with a little more precise reporting and tracking of those assets. Um, and then we have asked for a couple of asset classes that we want to actually change the useful life. And we've just seen from experience over the last five years or so um, that the useful life was not as accurate as we thought it would be five years ago. And so we've asked for a change in those as well. So that's something that's just new with respect to the, uh, to the report this time that we haven't had in the past. So I think I'll maybe just turn it over then to, um, to Michelle and she can present the audit findings report on behalf of KPMG. Okay, thank you. Um, so this report was just dropped on your desk and I will take you through it and please ask questions as we go if you wish. Um, I'll go through it um, reasonably quickly understanding the uh, time constraints that you have. So if we just turn to page one of that report and I give you just an overview of how the audit went, um, just a couple of things. First of all, this report is to assist you as a member of the Admin Policies Committee in your review of the results of the audit of the consolidated financial statements of the city um, so that you might um, move this forward to, to full council for approval. The, the uh, staff, once again, um, were very well prepared when we arrived to do the audit. You have had little turnover <clears throat> in your team over at um, the British Whig building and, and certainly with the leader through Desiree, your treasurer and CFO, and they're very well prepared. It's um, really wonderful to walk in and have the financial statements pretty much done so that we can just get going. And a lot of uh, moving parts with this financial reporting process for the city as they gather all of the uh, work of the other entities that are consolidated in. So a good understanding and, and again, very well prepared and, and we appreciate and thank them for that. As of um, today, we do have a few, out piece, few outstanding pieces of our audit that need to be done. The audit report that we will sign is to be dated the day that council approves the financial statements. We're anticipating that to be June 2nd. Um, and at that time, we would ask for a representation letter to be signed by management, which um, really says that they have provided us with everything, they're not aware of any other commitments or anything that's happened since year end that might impact the numbers or the operations of the city. So um, we'll look for that. And we have a little bit of work to do updating 
something that we call subsequent events. It's important for us to know whether or not up to that date there is something that would Im impair the numbers in the financial statements in any significant way. Um, usually we talk about sort of dramatic events happening and, and sadly the, a dramatic event that would happen would have been something like Fort McMurray. Obviously that changes the world in, in something that's to the extreme, but, but that's um, really what would really, um, if, if something happened then we would, we would need to disclose that. The, um, moving on, well actually speaking about the audit report, and I think there's a copy in the statements. Uh, that you had, our audit opinion is expected to be unqualified or a clean audit opinion, which is a good thing. Um, and it's uh, going to uh, say that in our opinion, the financial, the consolidated financial statements of this corporation of the city of Kingston do present fairly in all material respects in accordance with public sector accounting standards, which is the uh, suite of accounting policies which you're required to follow. So that's what we're anticipating. Turning to page two, and um, just some items. This report is designed to cover off matters which we're required by our profession to discuss with those charged with governance in the uh, um, financial reporting process. Um, and the first one is to let you know whether or not we were able to carry out the audit in accordance with the plan that we discussed with you earlier in the year, and we were able to, and that's a good thing. We didn't see, we didn't come across any surprises. We also spend some time in the audit, a fair bit of time, on the areas where management applies their judgment, and and um, and that is usually in the selection of accounting policies, which we drive by fast because you are required to follow public sector accounting standards and in the area of estimates in the financial statements. For other areas in the financial statements, we're able to get quite decent supporting documentation, either from the city or from third party. When there's an estimate, it just by its nature requires a process and just an understanding as to how management has built that up. And there are two significant estimates in the financial statements in our view, and I probably think in, in management's view as well, and that is in the area of the employer future benefit obligation, which is quite a large number. And we've talked about this before. You rely on an actuary to do evaluation on some of those costs. So that would be things like WSIB and any post-employment future benefits that you offer in the way of health or dental and that sort of thing. And we um, have, this was not evaluation year, so they extrapolate. And we've looked at the report from the actuaries and, and we concur with the presentation that's been then made in the financial statements. The second area is in the area of tangible capital assets. And you will note that that's quite a large number on your statement of financial position at 1.4 billion. And by its nature as to how it got set up originally without having everything available to go back to 50 years or so, um, it's just a large number, and we've heard from your CFO tonight that it can, the, the estimates are those that you place on the useful life of the equipment and the roads and the street lights and so on in there. And um, we look at it in sort of what seems sensible, what's right in the industry and so on, and work with management on that. We are not aware that there's any significant misstatements in, in that, and we would support that management has asked for a policy change to when you know that something's not lasting as long or going to last longer. There is one other, there is one change to your accounting policies this year. You had to adopt a new standard that we've been talking about forever it seems, and that's with respect to liabilities for contaminated sites. And that still says March 31st, even though I said December, but we, we're going to do this on your December year end. Um, the, there were no adjustments as a result of this standard, and um, this is just where there might be um, assets not in productive use, like a building or a parking lot or some such thing that might have contamination with it, whether or not that a liability would need to be set up to rectify the situation. So we are satisfied with the disclosure in there that there was not an adjustment needed. 
Also, with respect to our work, we're required to be independent and free of conflict of interest to carry out the audit. And the little bit there under independence is us updating and uh, giving you our um, belief that we are uh, in, a, in a position to do that. Turning to page four, um, I think we've pretty much talked about what's on this page. Uh, this is just considering that the significant accounting policies, which are disclosed in note one to the financial statements, which I know you've had, that does go on for a number of pages. Um, and then what are your significant accounting estimates? And I've already talked about the post-employment benefits and the uh, estimated useful lives of your tangible capital assets. And then just a final statement to say that we are, are uh, um, com uh, comfortable that all of the disclosures and presentation requirements that need to be made are, done so, are, are so done in your financial statements. Um, page five is probably um, pretty close to one of the next most important parts of this, I believe, and that is to just discuss the misstatements. And when we talk to you about our audit plan, we talk to you about the materiality level that we would set, and that was $10 million. And that's um, a number that we arrive at, which if there were misstatements that um, amounted to around that uh, 10 million, and they weren't made in the financial statements, we would believe that it would make a difference in a decision that a user might make looking at your statements, and we would not be able to give you a clean audit opinion or an unqualified audit opinion if that were so. The other part of that is that part of our, our requirements through our professional standards, auditing standards, does require us to discuss with you any misstatements that we came across during the audit. And um, our posting threshold on that is $500,000, and that's kind of just formula driven. Um, and at, we did not encounter any misstatements, whether they be corrected or uncorrected. So that was, again, a testament to the, uh, to the processes that are in place to get the financial statements prepared. On page six, um, we're, to the extent that we rely on internal controls to design our audit procedures, so those are controls that you have in place over payroll, for signing timesheets, for approving um, purchases, and so on. If we encountered any serious control deficiencies, we are required to bring those to your attention and to bring those to your attention in writing, and um, we did not identify any. From time to time, we have some housekeeping items just because we see a lot of things and we might discuss that with, um, with, your, with your management team. Page seven is just a list of all the other information that we're required to discuss with you if we found anything um, during the audit. And under all of those categories, we have no findings to bring to your attention. The balance of the report are just um, the appendices and uh, Appendix 1 really isn't anything much. Appendix 2 is the audit report, which you would have seen in the draft financial statements. And Appendix 3 is the management representation letter, which I referred to earlier, that we will have, um, we will have uh, your, uh, your uh, management team sign to us um, when you have approved the financial statements at Council. And that's our report. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks. Is this working now? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering what standard we would use. I guess this might be more for uh, the treasurer uh, for determining our uh, debt load and and what and putting it in perspective. Um, I just, I just noticed that it's 13% of the tangible asset uh, number, the 1.4 billion, uh, and I'm wondering how that sort of has been historically, and and what level of comfort I guess uh, the Treasury Department would have with that debt load. 
Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. So um, there, there's a number of things that go into that. So certainly just looking at it in terms of that key performance indicator around total debt to the, to the total net assets, we're pretty comfortable with that in terms of, of where that's landed in. Um, part of that reason is because, as you know, certainly during budget, we keep a, a very close tally on the level of debt that, that we feel comfortable in terms of assuming. Um, and that is is related to a number of things. Certainly, our reserve fund balances, so that we're we're managing pay as you go versus debt levels. Um, but it's also looking at projections for interest rates, um, as well as cash flow projections, because um, the reserve funds not only do we uh, take pay as you go funds out of there as opposed to issuing debt, we also use those same reserve funds to pay the debt off. So, so it's also looking at that. So, but we do look at that at the end of the year and we're usually pretty comfortable with that. Um, because I think the other thing just to point out is if you look at that net debt number, uh, it's less than what the long-term debt is. So, so we've, you know, we've paid down enough or we haven't assumed enough that it's going to drive that up. So we're fairly comfortable with it. So is it trending downwards or is it sort of staying even? Uh, the long-term debt is trending up. Right. Definitely trending up. Um, we have, so that, that $300 uh, million that's sitting there, um, council, we've approved probably closer to $500 million in total over the next few years based on the projections. Um, but what we also play with a little bit is the timing of that debt and when we're actually going to issue it. So we, uh, we build up probably about 15, 12 to $15 million of room every year as we're paying it down. That's the principal we pay off. So that, that gives us some room. Um, but we're also definitely creeping up. Now, once we get past a couple of the large utility projects, certainly the, the water plant and the sewer plant that are in there, then we see out in the out years, it'll start to come down. Once we get everything issued, it, we'll see it start to come down because our reserve funds are also building up with the 1%. Thank you. Um, when we make investments uh, into, say, capital assets and stuff like that, where are we banking on the money uh, coming from other than just taxes to pay for those things? Like when we have things like the hospital coming to town and we get a big uh, permit fee and stuff like that from a hospital that's getting built, uh, are we relying on that or is that a bonus? Or how do we look at a lot of these different uh, things that when we do go in debt for anything, whatever that may be, what are we banking on to pay for that debt? So there's a number of things besides taxes. So we, we've got primarily for any of our asset management type costs, and I'm going to say primarily because maybe not roads, um, but most of our other things like any of our building capital maintenance type things, any of our equipment, our fleet, that's all funded directly, pay as you go, like our savings account right from the reserve funds. And those reserve funds are built up from taxation from the 1% um, and from other revenue contributions as well. So that's primarily. The debt we, have, we tend to use, and this hasn't always been the case, but as we've been able to build up with the 1%, the capital reserve funds, uh, we tend to now use the debt for the larger projects. So the larger road projects like a JCB or new buildings, that kind of thing, new uh, water sewer plants and that sort of thing. So we tend to focus in on that. That hasn't always been the case. We've had to use debt in the past until we got those reserve funds built up for things like some of our transit buses as an example, but we're, we've tried to get away from that. Um, the other source of revenue is a couple other things. There are some provincial and federal grants, so they tend to be focused on specific projects. However, we do have the um, gas tax, the federal gas tax, which goes partially towards our roads and partially towards our transit costs. Um, I believe that's about seven or eight million dollars a year that we get there. Um, and then we do have our development charges and impost fees, which is another primary source. 
Um, now that can only go against growth related assets, so that can't be used to expand or maintain existing assets that we've got, but that would be for, for growth assets. So all those revenues are actually built into the projections. So if you look at our 15 year capital plans, we project and make estimates for all of those. The only thing that might not be in there would be grants that we didn't know about. So if a, if a grant came up, an opportunity to apply for a grant, it may be something we didn't have in the, uh, in the projections. But other than that, most of that's built in and, and estimated within our projections. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for the reports. Um, my question has to do, I guess, um, the uh, we, we've touched on a little bit in terms of the grants available. So for operating expenses, for example, what strategies could we potentially implement that might um, offset some of the, the cost overruns that we're experiencing currently? I, I guess it's directed, it's, it's more to do with um, municipal staff as far as what um, what there might be about what we could do to lobby or present options for um, it's probably not to do with that it's probably for later yeah you're right thanks uh, thank you mr. chair and through you I, I, I think the uh, this audit as last year is a testament to uh, the strong financial management that we have here at the city. We have a pretty uh, fantastic team with little turnover, which helps the auditors out quite a bit. Um, but my question is, having not seen a lot of municipal audits, do is, is this uh, pretty standard or, or do we have uh, financial statements in municipalities that do not present fairly? Through you, Mr. Chair. Most I actually have not had a qualification in a municipal audit in all of my career, and I don't think you have either, have you? You were older than me, but anyway. Um, there, you know, this is a testament to good management and good understanding and good processes in place. It's not here things tend to go smoothly with the audit, at some of our clients, that is not the case. You do have a lot of bumps along the way as you are working out what an estimate should be or what's happened with um, you know, a certain situation and how it's going to be disclosed. Um, that, that's a great question and, and it's um, one that I don't think we get often enough. But um, for us, a lot of it has to do with just a continuous communication with our clients throughout the year and that's what happens here. You have a, a team that knows the, what to do with the accounting framework. so they pretty much can determine it. But if there's something that's kind of out there, we discuss it throughout the year, and then we don't have surprises when we get to the end, and, and that is a testament again as well to your team so that we can just sort it out. Um, and we do reach further than our Kingston office with the rest of the KPMG team just to understand what we should be doing with, with that sort of thing. That's a good question. Uh, I haven't had many un, uh, qualified opinions in my career, and they're not that much fun. We, we would need more than 50 minutes if we had that sitting here, I'm quite sure.
So you're correct through you, Mr. Chair. You are correct. It will affect future uh, purchases. And that's been based on what we've been experiencing over the last five years. And I can tell you the reason that police cars is a little bit different. Um, eight years tends to be the average on something like a, a normal vehicle. Um, but police cars are on the road 24 hours a day. And so we didn't think about that five years ago when we set, we just said vehicles eight years. And what we've been finding is we're replacing them more like every four years, and that's why. And so that's why we've asked to have that change to reflect more of what our experience has been. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Okay, so uh, we have a recommendation here that the Administrative Policies Committee receive KPMG's 2015 audit findings report for the Corporation of the City of Kingston for the year ended December 31st, 2015, and the 2015 audit of financial statements of the Corporation of the City of Kingston for the year ended December 31st, 2015, and that the Administrative Policies Committee recommend that Council receive and approve the audited financial statements of the Corporation of the City of Kingston for the year ended December 31st, 2015, attached as Exhibit A, and that the tangible capital asset policy be updated to reflect new capital asset types, as well as changes to asset categories and estimated useful lives as outlined in this report. So do we have a mover of that recommendation or any discussion on it? Would someone like to move it? Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Holland. All those in favor? That passes unanimously. So on to business item 7B, the waiver of fee policies. I assume someone from staff would like to speak to that. Please go ahead. Through you, um I'll be very brief. I know we're short on time, but um, in front of you is really the summary of the past seven weeks of work to pull this together as quickly as we could. Um, summarizing uh, information I gained from my municipal peers across the province and working with staff from cultural services and from recreational leisure to pull together a policy that we feel meets the uh, request of council. Um, we are hoping that this will come into effect for June the 1st. We're working on the procedure that goes along with the policy in terms of the nitty gritty of what the application looks like and how it flows through our systems. Um, it's a little more complicated than other communities just because we have two departments feeding into this. So um, fortunately, we've got a great staff team that works well together. So I don't foresee any problems with it, but. Um, we are in the middle of working that out so we can be on the ground and ready to go for June the 1st. So I'm open to any questions that members of the committee have. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I apologize for not reaching out in advance because I have several questions um, and uh, um, and suggestions. I think this is great. I mean, I mean staff moved very quickly on this and uh, and, and brought it forward. Um, uh, but there are a few uh, items of concern. So I'm just looking at the policy itself. Um, and so I'm on uh, page two of six of the uh, exhibit um, and looking at um, the de sort of de uh, definition of vulnerable population. Um, it talks about uh, population groups within a community at greater risk on a number of social determinants of health, including, including social isolation. Um, these groups include recent immigrants, first people, single parents, persons with disabilities, children and youth, the elderly, persons living in poverty, and persons geographically isolated. I think these, this is great. I don't know if this is meant to be um, our standard policy definition, and I'm just, uh, I'm just worried that we, we might be leaving out um, human rights code groups that are vulnerable to attack. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking about LGBTQ um, community members. And so I'm wondering if th uh, that might fit underneath uh, this uh, description of vulnerable people. Population, I mean. To answer the first part of your question, the definitions in this policy relate specifically to this policy. So they're not standard corporate definitions. Um, so that's part one of your question. Certainly, if there's groups that uh, council feels are missing from that definition, um, we tried to make it as broad as we could, but obviously you've named one group that's not reflected on the policy, and certainly that could be um, added in if it's council's wish. There's no reason why that, that 
um, category couldn't be uh, included in the definition. We did want to try and contain it so the definition didn't end up to be everyone and we wanted to focus in, especially when we're talking programs that are um, potentially um, using our facilities for free. Um, we certainly wanted the uh, direction to be um, um, activities that would benefit any of those vulnerable populations. So certainly that's no problem to add that in if that's council's so, wish. So I can, I can leave that for uh, conversation between the committee when, uh, when we debate the motion as to whether or not we want to add that. Um, I, uh, I like that, not, that, that you've limited it to just one, um, one waiver of fees per calendar year. Um, and uh, I, my, my next question is, um, under 4.2 eligible applicants, organizations mandate aligns with cities' priorities. Again, which priorities are, is, is this our strategic priorities as a, a, as a corporation or is this uh, the council's strategic priorities? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the, um, are we asking for these organizations um, to have, uh, so they're, we're asking them to be uh, um, not-for-profits, and are there, do they have to carry liability insurance to have the fees waivers? So usually for uh, things, um, I, for our, I think as part of our other policies, they have to have liability insurance, so I'm just, checking in on where, what the potential barriers are um, as we kind of move forward through the, through the policy and through the process. Through you, Mr. Chair, to rent one of our facilities, access one of our facilities, you need to have liability insurance, although we have a corporate liability policy for some groups can access that if they don't have their own, depending on the nature of the organization applying. So. Um, yes, there needs to be liability insurance in place, whether they um, tag on to the city's liability policy or whether they have their own because they're a large enough organization to have their own. But that's part of their agreement to rent the facility, not part of the waiver of fees. So the two things are kind of tied together. Um, great, thank you. And I, again, I apologize for not sending these out in, in advance. Uh, I. Um, had a busy week. Can we, um, I, I wonder if uh, if we have a definition. So I, I went back and looked at the definitions at the beginning of this, and, and it says community good under 4.4 um, for um, eligible activities, but we don't really have a definition of community good in our uh, set of definitions. And so I'm wondering if we should uh, also consider a definition of community good or, um, or why we chose not to define it uh, so that we can move forward. Through you, we could certainly add in a definition. We were trying to allow it to be very broad because of the nature of the kinds of proposal we might be receiving. Um, it is a question in the application in terms of groups uh, describing to us the public community good that whatever they're proposing to do will have. Um, so we didn't feel the need to define it any more closely than that, but if there's a wish to put in a definition, it will be a very broad definition, however, um, but we could certainly add one in if it's needed. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I think I just have three more questions. I'm going to ask them all at once, um, or is it, I, I mean, we're moving fairly quickly, so I don't know if this is uh, okay. I don't think we're under the time constraints that we were under before either. Um, So, so if yeah, so if we're it, it, uh, when, when we debate, I'd be considering amendments to the policy, right? right? So when we when, well, I'm I'm just asking questions prior. I'm not planning to amend all of these. 
I'm just trying to get some context as to whether or not I may want to uh, support some of these or, or make these changes. Um, the, um, our, so uh, in 4.5 in eligible activities, um, it says fundraising activities that benefit one or multiple organizations. Is that, um, does that mean that we're talking about the operating costs of an organization? So, you know, for example, if, if the fundraiser that they're proposing is to uh, help run a program to support refugees in Kingston, um, it, how do we define what, whether that is uh, of a benefit to the organization that's delivering that service um, uh, as opposed to a benefit directly to those refugees? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, it's fundraising period, um, with the exception, as noted, of um, activities like the hockey for, can you remember the name of it, the hockey tournament that gives an equivalent amount back to the city, uh, hockey for homeless, uh, that gives an equivalent amount back to the city for our program, so it's really a, a cash in and out in their case. Um, but that would be the only exception. Uh, the reason we did that, and that's quite common in all the policies I looked at, um, there'd be no way of saying no. Um, even just United Way fundraisers cover a huge amount of fundraisers over the years. So um, there is probably at least five or six fundraisers going on any weekend in our community. Um, so we would be getting a lot of proposals and it would be very difficult to distinguish what's an appropriate fundraiser and what's not. It's much easier to just say, no, not fundraisers, period. So that's why we went that way. And that, as I said, is very common on all the other policies. Uh, thank you. That's, that's a very, very interesting point because many of the, the, the requests that counselors get or bring forward have some sort of fundraising component uh, um, associated. Not all of them, but ma many. And so it's um, something that uh, we'll have to consider as counselors going forward because this doesn't um, uh, it doesn't address what we were what, what some of us were trying to address with bringing this forward and perhaps uh, perhaps we may need more detail around um, the logic behind that um, to move forward. My last one, <laughs> so sorry, um, is. Um, Um, I, 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 and this is actually just a process question. This is um, it, it, it is uh, it, it, it is uh, when uh, when is a special events application applicable on top of a regular park equipment booking request? And that's this is more just for the purpose of the committee to know. You may have finally stumped me. Um, <laughs> I think it depends on the nature of the activities, whether it requires a special event permit. As you can see, alcohol's a no-go as far as waiving the fees, but um, you know, I, I would think something like a wedding in one of our facilities requires a special events permit. Mm -hmm. I'm not honestly sure of the details without looking at the policies to distinguish the difference, but um, a special event that's open to the public or where alcohol is going to be served, et cetera, I think are the kinds of things that require a special event permit versus just a facility booking where you're booking a room for a meeting. Um, I think it depends on the nature of the event, but I can't quantify which is which and why. Thank you, and thank you for indulging me with all these questions. Uh, I think that it's, it's just, it's useful for us. We get asked these questions as counselors a lot, um, especially around things like this, and it's because it's not something we deal with all the time, it, 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 I just thought I'd use this opportunity to learn that. But it seems to me that this process, um, and if you could just confirm for me, like it, this process is generally where we'll have um, through our website and, and through our, our clerk's office or our front desk um, an intake and we'll guide people through what, which forms they may want to fill out and, and might be eligible for in order to help facilitate their success at booking because ultimately we want our municipal properties to be used whether we're 
getting paid for them or not, right? So I'm assuming we facilitate that process. Yes, in fact, that, to answer your question, that's why we uh, align this with the whole process of booking a facility rather than doing like a grant, which as many other communities do, you apply once a year like our community grants. We felt it makes more sense to align this with the time you're actually asking to use the facility. You'll get a price back. You'll decide, oh my goodness, we can't run it for that price. Can you waive the fees? And the processes will run in tandem for both uh, the Grand Theater and our uh, museums, our cultural facilities, as well as our recreation facilities. So we're just spelling out exactly how that's going to work. But basically, the two will run in tandem. The information will be available on the city website in the same place the applications to use those facilities are. So it'll be as transparent as we can make it. Thank you, I really appreciate, I really like that approach to this because uh, we do already have grants programs and so um, I appreciate the clarification of that. That's all I have for questions at the moment. Thank you and uh, Councillor Holland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have lots to say that's very, very positive and just sort of overwhelmingly um, appreciative of, of this initiative but I'm going to save that for the next part when we have our discussion. Uh, my question, I have two questions. The first has to do with um, whether or not we've calculated any savings in staff time, um, not having to administer the fees, for example. Uh, um, no is the answer to the question. I don't think there will be any savings because this process requires staff time. Um, in fact, if anything, it's going to require slightly more staff time to assess the applications fully and get them through the system and the timelines we've laid out. So I would say, if anything, it's going to be slightly more labor intensive than just um, billing someone and giving them a fee and collecting the money. So um, this process is not a cost savings from that perspective. Okay, um, and then I guess the second question has to do with accessibility. So the, one of the requirements to be eligible is that, that the event is accessible. What I love most about this is that our municipal facilities are accessible and many, many facilities in the city are not. So is there currently an increased demand for accessible facilities? And do you think we can continue to meet that demand as we move forward offering this program? Through you, Mr. Chair, I think most public events in most communities now are um, being held in accessible facilities, to answer your question. Um, the demand is increasing because of the AODA demands, but then again, there are more and more facilities because the standard's so high now that for every new facility, accessibility is not even a question. Um, so I'm not sure that the demand is greater than the number of facilities that are available. Um, Time will tell, but uh, certainly our hotel facilities, et cetera, are all meeting that new standard. So the city is not the only one with accessible facilities. Um, if that answers your question. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, I will uh, move. Oh, sorry, Mr. Dixon. Certainly, um, the city is required to find disabilities the same way the Human Rights Code defines disabilities, which is everything from needing to wear glasses to physical other uh, mobility issues to mental health. It covers a wide gamut. So um, in all of the city's documents, the question earlier around common definitions, the city defines disabilities the same way the AODA and the Human Rights Code defines disabilities. We have no choice to define it any other way.
Thank you uh, for the question. Um, applications will come in on a first come first serve basis in line with when they're submitting their applications to use the facilities. We've asked for the allocation to be what we hope is gives us enough room to get us through a 12 month period. We won't really know until we actually get this program in place. So we're basing it on our past experience, other communities experience. Um, it's a little bit in terms of the price tag of a shot in the dark for now, to be perfectly honest, but we wanted to make sure there was room. Um, and in terms of having deadlines, that was discussed with staff. Staff wanted it aligned with the room booking timeline, which is basically first come, first serve. They have to be able to confirm A, the price, B, the, the facilities available, et cetera, before we can even entertain a waiver of fees. Um, so um, they want to do it on a kind of a first come, first serve basis and leave it open-ended. That does create a little more work, um, but that's how our frontline staff and those two departments wanted the process to operate. Um, and quite frankly, if that's how they want it to operate, that's how it should operate. The other thing is, um, doing it the way we're doing it makes it much more flexible if somebody decided to run an event now in September. If the deadline was last month, they'd be out of luck with applying for a waiver of fees. This provides a lot more flexibility from the community's perspective in terms of uh, short time frames and you know pulling off an event in a fairly short period of time. Um, so we wanted to be as flexible from the community's perspective but make it reasonable for uh, staff from the operational perspective. So this was the balance that we think we've drawn that first year will obviously be a learning curve for us. Um, so the procedure itself may change a little. We're hoping the policy can stay pretty much the same. Um, and then we may just need to alter the actual procedure process internally. Thank you. We won't be advertising the waiver fees per se. We're not setting this up to encourage applications uh, necessarily. Information will be available on our facilities as it always is on our website and through city staff. Um, and city staff will work with groups that are running our facilities in terms of this opportunity if it's needed. Um, but we're not going to advertise this per se. We're not looking to draw more people into our facilities and ask for a waiver of fees. This is really in um, a reference to requests we've already had of groups using our facility or wanting to use our facilities but having that uh, cost barrier. So we're not advertising this program per se, it's going to be attached to um, our usage of our facilities more generally. If that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, so we have a recommendation before us that the Administrative Policies Committee recommends that the following recommendation be approved and forwarded to Council for consideration at its meeting scheduled May 17, 2016. That Council approve the waiver of fees policy attached as Exhibit A to report number AP16-015 and that Council approve an upset limit of $10,000 for June 1st to December 31st, 2016 to be funded from the Working Fund Reserve to offset approved waivers of fees during that time period and that Council direct staff to include an amount of $20,000 in future operating budgets to be used to offset waivers of fees and that a bylaw be presented to Council and given three readings at the May 17, 2016 Council meeting in order to amend bylaw number 2005-10 as amended being a bylaw to establish fees and charges to be collected by the Corporation of the City of Kingston attached as Exhibit B to report number AP-16-015 in order to delegate to the Chief Financial Officer City Treasurer the authority to waive fees for not-for-profit organizations requesting use of municipal facilities as defined in the waiver of fees policy and the staff be directed to provide council with an annual report to summarize all requests received in the waiver of fees approved. So do we have a mover? Councillor Holland, seconded by Councillor Cannon. Any further discussion? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, I, I have actually two additional quick questions um, uh, before I make uh, a couple comments. Um, one is, uh, uh, and I'll ask them both, um, 
first is, um, do we have data um, um, from the requests that staff have gotten over um, the, the years that we were reviewing in terms of building this policy about how many of these uh, requests were related to fundraisers versus other types of events? Um, and then second, um, uh, is two years maybe too far out for the first review of this policy? Maybe um, I'm wondering if we should consider reviewing it uh, in a year or in 18 months um, uh, to, uh, to move quickly on any initial um, changes that we might want to make uh, based on the first year of, of, of working with it. Through you, Mr. Chair, the first part of your question, going back to uh, 2012, um, the only uh, official fundraiser uh, that we've, uh, councils uh, entertained um, was the Hockey for Homeless event that's happened in the past couple years, um, past two years, I think. Um, the other waivers that have made it to council have been for other events like the food, uh, the, uh, um, Salvation Army's distribution of their uh, food, the perch derby, and that sort of thing. Um, but the only uh, fundraiser on the list that I can tell um, would be the um, uh, Hockey for Homeless, which again would qualify because we're receiving an equivalent amount back. Uh, and Ms. Hurdle had a point to make that was good on the fundraiser part. <laughs> Thank you, and, and sorry, it took me bit of time to catch on to this one, but um, I just want to point out, if you look under eligible activities, we have two points, the, the first bullet and a third bullet. It's very specific that the either special event or program must be free of charge to attendees. Most fundraisers, there are going to be some form of collection of money um, or else they're not going to make, you know, there's not going to be a Point, really probably they won't make much money out of that fundraiser so the um, and again the intent is to make sure that uh, people have access regardless of their income level and that the events that we're supporting our programs can provide that free access so if we go with the fundraiser route there might be a little bit of a contradiction with um, the rest of the policy And just uh, my, my second question about the review period. Um, I don't know if the two years is just our standard policy review time period, or um, if uh, uh, or if we should maybe have a consider uh, moving up our initial review. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, we'll be bringing council an annual report on exactly what's happened. And should there be issues flagged even within six months of launching this, if by next September, you know, for some reason that we couldn't predict, there are issues, don't worry, we'll be coming back before council to say we've got a glitch in our policy we need to fix. Um, but two years, we felt if everything is going well, um, is probably a good time frame to do a review. But certainly if there are issues, we'll either bring them back in the annual report um, or um, we'll wait for the two years or we'll bring them back sooner. So um, again, this is new. It's not a revision of a policy. It's a new policy. So um, we felt that two years will give us a chance to really um, test it out. Um, and we may internally have to make some smaller changes, but if it affects the policy, we'll be bringing that back as soon as we know the policy needs to change. Uh, thank you. So just a few quick comments. I, I'm going to um, support the recommendations in the policy as it stands, uh, bearing in mind all of my questions and comments, um, I, mostly to uh, see uh, what the uptake takes, it lo looks like and uh, to uh, review the, the report that we get when we get um, a chance to review that report coming forward. I. Um, uh, I'm, I'm all for continuous improvement, so I'm okay with kind of keeping an eye or keeping these things that I highlighted in the back of my mind while we move forward with this policy. Um, and I'd much rather see us get this uh, framework in place uh, rather than um, uh, debate uh, specifics that can be amended over time uh, based on the situations and what we're seeing in the response from the community. 
Thank you. Councillor Hellman, do you have some questions? Just comments. Thank you, comments, Mr. Sir. Chair. So yes, now I want to tell you all how excited I am about this. Thank you so much. I, I feel like this, I didn't really know that this was coming, although it seems like it's such a, an important, it ties in to the initiatives that we've been discussing in this committee, um, specifically open government and all the work that's gone into that and the work of trying to engage the public and trying to make them sort of connect with us the first way to do that is to show them that we are, of course, offering what most taxpayers would consider to be public space at no cost for public events. Um, having organized and operated a number of activities in the city over the years, uh, it's a bit disheartening, I have to say. Frankly, you know, being part of an organization that works really hard, a bunch of volunteers getting together, and 70 bucks, you know, or so of your, your own operating budget has to go into paying for a facility that, um, that the city owns. So I'm, I'm delighted for lots of reasons, um, mainly to do with just again opening us up and making us look like we actually are, uh, we are operating with the public good in mind, which of course we are, we know that we are, but it, it just sends a, a bigger, better message along those lines that we're trying to send as a council. Um, also not to mention, as it was alluded to by staff, that. There are many, many other organizations, including nonprofits and school boards and the library that have space. So we're, this idea of having fees, while there is a cost associated with it, there are lots of other groups that are trying to sort of subsidize their own rent and activities by opening up their space and being more collective. And what comes with that, I think, is an ultimate benefit in that people see that space as, as a welcoming place to be. Uh, and we could potentially have lost those opportunities if we weren't moving forward with, the, with this initiative. So I'm very grateful um, from that perspective as well. And I guess also just again to, I know we're not really advertising this, but I think it does, it does send a very strong message to the number, the numerous community volunteers uh, and organizations that we have operating who are familiar with, with the fees. Um, that we appreciate their work, and it's, it's a message I'm so happy and proud to uh, put out there, so I'm very grateful for this recommendation, and we'll be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? No? Okay, so we have a recommendation before us. Do we have a mover? Yeah. Or we already have a mover, so all those in favor? And that recommendation passes, so... On to item 7C, which is the 2015 workplace health, workplace health and Safety Report. The report of the Commissioner is attached, and this report is for information purposes only, but I'm assuming staff would like to speak to it. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as mentioned, this report is for um, information purposes only. It's an annual report that we bring to this committee. Um, it outlines the 2015 stats for health and safety for all employees. Uh, and encompasses all employees across all the cities in all of our different uh, facilities. So as you can see that a lot of the stats are on a downward trend, which is quite good. Um, we've had a decrease in our WSIB claims, our lost times, our accidents. Um, a lot of that effort had to go towards um, working with management at Rideau Crest, as well as transit, um, some who are here. So uh, thank you very much. They uh, were very helpful and supportive. Um, we completed a huge audit at Rideau Crest and developed standard operating procedures, trained all of our employees. And in 2015, we saw a huge decrease in our number of accidents there. So that was a good result. A lot of work also happening with transit. Um, we had in 2014, the highest numbers of slips, trips and falls at transit, getting in and off the bus. Um, we did a lot of education and awareness in transit and also decreased um, our accidents there as well. Um, also in conjunction with health and safety comes wellness. And a lot of initiatives have taken place um, in 2015 and continue into 2016, um, looking at mental health um, sessions and seminars, looking at smoking cessations. We look at baseline cardiovascular um, again, to provide awareness to those employees, um, to increase um, them to look at their wellness and to um, seek medical attention if they need to do so. Um, we've seen a lot of very good um, stats regarding this as well. 
and um, we're looking at our claims on a go forward basis to see with all of this training, this awareness, are some of our benefit claims gonna start to decrease as well? So that's something we're looking at into 2016 and 2017. Um, uh, other initiatives we're looking at as well in, in 2016 is compliance obviously with the occupation health and safety regulations. Um, each year there's new legislation that comes into play and we have to adhere to those. So ongoing training with all of our supervisors and managers is a core initiative for us, um, as well as providing as much training to our employees um, as possible as well, because um, they're the frontline people who are actually doing the work. <clears throat> so um, besides that, if there's any questions, any within the report? Thank you, any questions, Councilor Allen? Uh, thank you uh, for this report. It, uh, it's uh, great to see trend lines going down. I'm going to assume that in 2016 the total WSIB costs are going down too, and so we can uh, we can't judge you know based on one jump uh, in in terms of costs. Um, I'm wondering, looking at the uh, moving forward goals, I'm wondering if there are uh, wellness initiatives uh, planned for counselors. Uh, sometimes we sit for long periods of time um, and uh, could could use a little bit of uh, wellness or mental health support. Um, I'm kind of saying that jokingly, but I'm not totally joking. Um, uh, we have uh, we have uh, just just call the EAP. She says so. I will call. I will call. I will call the EAP uh, because I have not prevented it from happening. Um, but anyway, this this report's good. It's good to see that you're seeing what's coming down the line in terms of legislation and starting to move in, in advance uh, to be prepared to address that. So I appreciate um, seeing these numbers and seeing that our organization is a, a safe place that is uh, encouraging healthy, happy people. And uh, we need to make sure that we continue along that alignment because um, it just, it turn, translates to so much into productivity and into service and into um, uh, having a great organization that our community wants to deal with. And so I, I appreciate all of these uh, and I don't have a question, although I should have just been asking a question. Commissioner Beach. So I will only make one short comment to your non-question. Um, just with respect to the cost of WSIB continuing to decrease, uh, we can influence the number of incidents that happen mainly by trying to prevent them from happening in the workplace. Um, what has happened though is there's been some regulatory changes that will actually probably drive our costs higher. So we will be coming forward to council with some reports um, but that is something that we can't control is when the provincial regulation changes and there's additional things that are covered, but uh, we will be coming back and talking to you about that later this year. Just, just to quickly follow up, it, it, uh, I just would suggest that like in a report like this that if legislation is driving it up and not injury, um, we, it should just be noted so that we can understand because it, it looks a little aberrant when we're seeing such great success in our slips and falls, for example. And so um, it'd be, it'll help us in the report and anyone else who wasn't here to hear that answer. So thank you. Okay, any further comments? Seeing none, okay, so that was an information report only. So we'll move on to item 7D, which is the Reader Crest Home Board of Management. So we need a mover for a motion that we resolve ourselves into the Board of Management for the Rear Crest Home. Councillor Allen moved and seconded by Councillor Cannon. All those in favor? That passes. So item uh, A, Rear Crest Home Board report for February 2016. And please go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just do a quick overview of the report that we sent to you. Um, Year-to-date occupancy rate is 98.77. The home experienced an extremely high bed turnover in March and April, with up to seven vacant, bed, vacant beds at the time. We currently have all 170 beds occupied to date. Rita Crest had seven incidents of report that were reportable to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care during this reporting period, two of which were outbreaks. And we had an influenza A outbreak, which was declared 
on one terrace on March 10th and was declared over on March 18th. A second outbreak, influenza B, was declared on a second terrace on March 14th and was resolved on March 22nd. I'd like to note that the influenza A outbreak was limited to three residents and only one staff member and that was, we were querying whether that was actually influenza. And the B outbreak involved only one resident and no employees. The short duration and limited no number of people affected in both outbreaks is attributed to our excellent, excellent infection prevention and control measures which include immunization, hand hygiene, use of uh, protective equipment, and uh, increasing housekeeping measures for infection control. We currently have 370 people on our waiting list. The Ministry of Labour visited the home on March 22nd. Uh, we, he, they had received a complaint of resident to staff abuse. The inspector did a complete investigation and there were no findings of non-compliance during this visit. Our financials revealed that as of the end of March, we were $85,000 over budget. $34,000 of that amount were unbudgeted wages for accommodated workers. We have received $31,000 from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care that was not budgeted, for which will help offset the numbers. And we, there are, were also three payrolls in uh, March as well, so that may have contributed to the variance. Our financials for April should be available shortly, and we'll update you at the next meeting. We've attached our Kai high results for uh, Q3 to 200, 2015 and our Health Quality uh, Ontario Annual Plan that we submitted on March 31st. I do apologize, um, due this, I think due to the size of the file, the um, Health Quality Plan, you only received a portion of it. Um, so we can try to resend that in a two smaller files so we have that available for you. Or we can do that or any time at all, you can go to hqontario.ca and just follow, uh, just go under the quality improvement plans and it, it is a public report. Okay, okay. we'll send it though. Thank you, is there any questions, Councillor Holland? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I guess just looking at the area where we're over budget, which has to do with wages, essentially what we're talking about, unbudgeted accommodations and modifications. I'm reading between the lines a lot here, but that to me implies that workers are unable to fulfill their obligations as they, as mandated by their contracts, need either more time off or different working conditions in order to continue in their roles. Um, so looking at the numbers here, so we've got 34,000 um, accommodated and 22,000 for modified. So if we add those two together, because I'm again making an assumption that they're related, um, there's $56,000 of the $85,000 over budget, which has to do with workers who need support in some way, financial or in some way that the employer uh, says the employer have to um, take a loss to support them. Back to, I guess, my question earlier in the discussion this evening, is there a way, this seems to me to be a fairly predictable cost overrun, is there a way beyond the amounts that we're receiving currently from the province to have this dealt with um, so that we don't experience this type of overrun continually and so obviously that the employer and the employees are, are both protected in these situations. So I'll uh, thank you through Mr. Chair. I'll start and, and I'm sure that um, 
my colleague will add to my answer. I will speak to the $34,000 specifically for the two unbudgeted positions of accommodated workers. So those two positions are actually coming from another department and we know that there will be a transfer, uh, a financial transfer that will take place as well at some point in time during the year. Um, these um, two individuals had to be accommodated in a different type of work. So the, the funding is somewhere in the corporation. It just wasn't initially budgeted in Rideau Crest, but there will be a, uh, a financial transfer. Thank you. Any further comments, questions? I guess just to sort of get to the like what I really want to get at here is that is there a way that we can as a council as um, the governing body advocate that would benefit the organization or benefit the workers that we're not currently doing you mean at like a provincial level or something is Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. The, the only thing that I, I think at this point I would like to or be able to add would be that accommodations can also be, uh, well, most of the time they, they may be temporary, so maybe that there's a situation and a staff, um, uh, there may be a staff person that has a certain restriction, but that's, um, that may be temporary. So what we're seeing in terms of accommodation may not necessarily be something that is permanent. Now they may also come and go, meaning if something happens to another staff, we may have a requirement to accommodate. Um, so that's, I guess that's the information I would add. I don't know if you have anything else, uh, Deb. So that's what I was going to add is that the $22,000 that we're over currently in modified workers is of the budget for the year. So with, with a lot of the return to works and everything we do with occupational health as people return to work, we hope that trend isn't consistent throughout the year and that, that as the second quarter ends plateaus and we are successful in bringing people back to work healthy and, and ready to work so we don't see that continue. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. So that was for information only. So uh, we do need to rise from the uh, board of the management for Rio Crest Home. So moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Cannon. All those in favor? That passes. So there's no motions, no notice of motion, no other business, no correspondence. So the date and time of the next meeting is July 4th, 2016, and motion to adjourn. Oh, actually, yes, that's a good point. So it's a Monday, July 4th, uh, because we're on the summer schedule. So just so everybody knows. Uh, and Councillor Cannon was moving a motion to adjourn and no seconders for adjourn. Oh, Councillor Holland, all those in favor? Thank you. And we are adjourned.